Uh, good afternoon, all, and welcome to today's discussion, which is a continuation uh, of the CSPC Federal Budget Symposium event. We are on the sixth session of non-governmental organizations. We appreciate the audience, all of you, joining us in this session. A reminder that there will be a Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen later on, and please upvote the questions. The chat line will be used uh, internally with uh, the organizers as well. And I'd like to thank the speakers for joining us today, and we're looking forward to our conversation. I'm your moderator, Andre Albanati, Principal at Ernst Cliff Strategy Group in Ottawa, and a volunteer advisor to the CSPC board, which is a lot of fun, I have to say. Uh, they're a fun crew. I'm also an unapologetic science policy nerd, which is why I enjoy doing this. I would now like to introduce our panel. I've been instructed by our fabulous organizers to be brief, and really it's difficult because of the long list of accomplishments and passions that each of these individuals bring to their work. And uh, as such, I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to tell us. I'm going to start with Janessa Greening, who is president and CEO of the BC Women's Health Foundation, where she collaborates with those who share her commitment to gender equity in healthcare and invests in charitable causes that deliver social change. She was selected by the Governing Council of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, many of us know it by CIHR, to join their advisory board with the Institute of Gender and Health. Janessa served as a member of the Prime Minister's Women Deliver National Council and is a member of the World Health Organization's Working Group on Advocacy and Communications for the Cervical Cancer Elimination Initiative. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Giselle Yasmin. Dr. Yasmin is currently Executive Director of Food Secure Canada, as well as Senior Fellow at the University of British Columbia, Adjunct Professor at Royal Roads University, and an affiliate of McGill's Institute for Global Food Security. Giselle has also advised numerous organizations, including the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, a European Union funded project on food security, the World Bank, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, and the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems. Giselle is currently a member of the Scientific Committee of City Food Project at New York University. Welcome. Also joining us today is Maya Roy, CEO of YWCA Canada, the nation's largest and oldest gender equity organization, and is a seasoned policymaker and nonprofit leader with over 20 years of experience in a range of sectors, including childcare, employment and workforce development, healthcare, immigration and settlement, and the women's sector. Maya served as strategic co lead on a feminist economic recovery plan for Canada, making the economy work for everyone, the first nationally focused plan of its kind in the world. And also joining us today is Nizar Ladakh, who is CEO at New Digital Research Infrastructure Organization, NDRIO, a federally funded not-for-profit organization playing a critical role helping to advance the integration and improvement of digital tools and services for Canadian researchers. I have to say that uh, I, enjoyed to, I enjoyed finding out that his passion in finding innovative solutions to operational problems uh, is, is something that he enjoys, mentoring teams and volunteering his time in not profit and social service organizations. So I think he'll have a perspective across a number of, uh, uh, of organizations as we uh, start this conversation. To start us off, I'd now like to turn it over to Janessa Greening uh, with some opening comments. Thank you, Andre. And um, I just want to express my gratitude for being invited to participate on this panel and to be included with such an incredible group of persons doing such meaningful work across the country. Um, again, my name is Janessa Greening, and I'm the president and CEO of the BC Women's Health Foundation. And we are um, dedicated to the full spectrum of women's health across the province of BC. More specifically, our hope is that women get equitable access to the quality um, healthcare that they deserve when, where, and how they need it. And so for us, you know, this um, last week's budget held a lot of high hopes for us when it came to investments in women's health, women's health research, reproductive health, and gender equity initiatives. And overall, we walked away quite encouraged with what we, um, we heard and what we saw. And I don't want to take 
Maya, but I do want to take a moment to just say how exciting it was to see such substantive investments in childcare, um, and you know, to see not just uh, the commitment to get there, but the dollars to make it happen. And um, you know, I also want to just kind of lay out my deep gratitude for the four decades plus advocacy efforts it took to get to that announcement last week. And it cannot be underestimated how absolutely essential that announcement will be, not just to our economic recovery, but to our community's fabric across this country. For us, you know, in our particular sector, in women's health, um, you know, looking at the 2021 budget, we have um, actually quite a bit of high praise for it. Uh, in particular, there were um, two things we wanted to flag um, that came out that I think speak to the spirit of innovation that have been uh, discussed throughout this symposium. The first one was on page 238, um, which was about the establishment of a National Institute for Women's Health Research. And um, just like childcare, this took uh, several years um, of advocacy. We, as, um, as a foundation, started speaking directly to folks in Ottawa about this starting in November of 2018. And to see it move beyond the mandate letters of health and the women and gender equity um, or equality folks into the budget and to see a $20 million investment to start it, um, I would argue is our organization's finest achievement to date. Women don't have equitable access to quality health care. And in large part because the research hasn't been funded. We have applied male physiology to our health system and to our research and to our diagnostics and to our treatment. And as a result, women are getting substandard health care. And we are really grateful to see that this National Institute will address these longstanding gaps. It is something that will allow us to dedicate our resources to women's health research that only not only benefits Canadian women and women in Canada, but also women globally. It will use a multidisciplinary collective that will drive progress in women's health from microscope to patient care and from health promotion all the way to policy development. You know, we've been releasing reports under an unmasking gender uh, inequity banner since uh, November of last year. And one of the things that we stated in our initial report, which was a socioeconomic report back in November, was that currently right now in the province of British Columbia, we're losing $2.6 billion annually due to lost productivity due to women missing time at work due to health concerns. And that's actually $17.9 billion federally. So we're grateful to see this investment in a national institute dedicated to women's health research, as we do believe it's not just going to impact the health of women and their, uh, the health outcomes, but also the health systems, but also our economy. And we were equally buoyed by the fact that um, we saw in the budget a commitment to sure that there is better access to sexual and reproductive health care in this country. And we were asked to submit a brief um, back in December by the federal government that we believe um, informed a couple of the announcements specifically. And one of them was the development of a national health survey, um, sexual health survey, and then the funding of community-based organizations that help make sexual and reproductive health care information services more accessible to vulnerable populations. And so if you go to pages 238 and 239 in the budget, it specifically speaks to those investments. And the first one being a, for, a, a the, the actual survey itself, we're the only country in the G7 currently right now that does not do a national sexual health survey. It is something that'll provide data to the government that will help them inform spending and future policy developments. And that um, investment of the $7.6 million over the next three years uh, in helping stats can mainstream that data collection will be absolutely essential to providing meaningful supports to sexual and reproductive health in our country. Secondarily, that $45 million that is specifically looking at um, providing community-based supports to improved access to sexual and reproductive health information, as well as services and programs is something that can't be underestimated. So no budget, not even a $101 billion one is going to address everybody's concerns and wants and hopes um, for a different future. And there's real and valid criticism right now and tax reform, affordable housing and pharma care that I do believe desperately still need to be considered. But I was buoyed by what happened last week from a women's health perspective and decades of advocacy has manifested in this budget across the board for a lot of us on this call. 
And we know that advocacy affects policy change and policy change drives investment and investment can improve the lives of Canadians. And so we um, were grateful to see a budget that I would argue was rooted deeply in activism and advocacy. And we're excited about the possibility of working with uh, partners in government to see these things come to fruition. Thank you so much, Janessa. And now uh, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Giselle Yasmin. Thank you very much, uh, André. I am joining you here from beautiful Musqueam territory on the West Coast, uh, Greater Vancouver. And uh, I would like to just introduce the work of Food Secure Canada, where I'm executive director. Uh, en français, on s'appelle le réseau pour une alimentation durable, qui veut dire autre chose, but happy to answer your questions in French if there are any. And we are a national pan-Canadian pan alliance, not-for-profit devoted to achieving healthy, just, and sustainable food systems. And we do that by engaging in knowledge sharing, uh, networking, and advocacy. Uh, so we were also, we have also published a, an analysis on our website of the federal budget. And if I, if I could just break down my remarks into our core goals of zero hunger, uh, sustainable food systems and healthy and safe food, which is where our focus is. Anything, I think, repeating or building on what Janessa said, anything that uh, addresses systemic inequalities, uh, poverty, uh, you know, including fem or sexism, racism, uh, colonialism, all of the impacts of, of all of that, and the, the structures, uh, unequal structures in our society does have a, a positive impact on food security. Uh, so, you know, the fact that there has been a recognition of that, building on the success of the Ch Canada Child Benefit, for example, the fact that this budget recognizes those systemic inequalities uh, is generally speaking a good thing. Uh, anything, uh, congratulations to the housing activists, the daycare activists. We see these as sister social movements in many ways, trying to achieve many of the same objectives. So anything that will relieve pressure on the family budget is uh, extremely important when it comes to food security. And when there are families living in poverty who have to choose between rent and income, you can, or rent and putting food on the table, you can see why uh, this, this is important. And Canada, unfortunately, was trending in the wrong direction even before COVID-19. So one of the top statisticians in the country, Valerie Tarasuk at University of Toronto, put out statistics that showed that, you know, at least 4 million Canadians were food insecure. That was before COVID-19. And with the loss of livelihoods, uh, that ex is expected to get worse. So these income supports are extremely important. We're an urbanized society. So a lot of food security has to do with income and income inequality. Uh, we were also pleased to see investments in, well, Nutrition North needs a lot of work, but our understanding is that there is, we've criticized it a lot, but that there are maybe some changes underway. So we hope that that will go in the right direction. Uh, we were pleased to see supports in the Indigenous Community Support Fund. Um, First Nations maintained inner communities are 10 times as likely to be food insecure uh, than others, but what's up, what's not clear is to what extent this will be a decolonized type approach to a program a design and, and delivery. In terms of sustainable food systems, you know, it, essentially, I want to quote a, a Cree saying, when the last tree is cut down, the last fish eaten and the last stream poisoned, you will realize you cannot eat money. So at the end of the day, our wealth comes from the earth. And uh, we were pleased to see investments uh, further to a, a lot of advocacy by some of our allies uh, to move towards more sustainable food production systems um, and also climate change, uh, environment and climate change. I want to note something for the West Coast, 647 million over five years to stabilize and conserve wild Pacific salmon. So that was something, you know, uh, we we were pleased, or, or at least we, we, we hope that that will offer um, some respite and hopefully re, re, rebuilding those stocks. Uh, a lot of work on temporary foreign workers, as you know, how our food is produced is an important question. Um, however, so we need to move towards a more sustainable food systems. However, the unfortunately, the budget is silent on health and nutrition issues. And this is a big problem. We have got a great new Canada food guide as of 2019. Uh, it's in line with all of the guidelines that have come out, science-based guidelines. 
diet related diseases costing us $26 billion a year in this country. So that also goes with poverty. It's not that people don't know how to eat well, they can't afford to. Uh, we were disappointed, of course, that uh, the commitment in budget 2019 to talk to the provinces about a national school food program is not there. We're the only G7 country that doesn't have such a program. It's caught between this jurisdictional, these jurisdictional issues. Uh, but, uh, and there's no reference to the sustainable development goals, which is a bit surprising. Um, the Auditor General came out with a report just last week showing that, oof, Canada needs to get its act together. We're only eight and a half years away. And of course, the sustainable development goal number two aligns perfectly with our mandate, zero hunger, improved nutrition, and moving to sustainable food systems. Merci. Thank you very much for that. That was a, a, a terrific amount of data that you're providing us that we look forward to digging into. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Yasmin. And now, uh, Maya Roy, over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to the organizers for this invitation and this opportunity. Uh, very much looking forward to this conversation. Um, my name is Maya. I'm, I'm the CEO of YW. CA Canada. Um, and just very quickly to share with you, we're a large federation of gender equity women's organizations. Um, we offer 50 childcare centers, 34 shelters, and 2,000 units of affordable housing. So just to give you a bit of a sense, um, for us at YWCA, it was very much getting a sense from our service users and our frontline staff what they wanted to see in the budget and doing work over about a year, um, as Andre mentioned, around putting together some kind of a recovery plan. For us in the budget, and I'll just very quickly share with you, um, we knew going into the budget that there were a few key things that we would be looking for. And at YWCA Canada, it was really important for us to essentially follow, to follow the disaggregated data with respects to the stats. So we know uh, COVID is impacting women disproportionately. Um, women and gender diverse people have absorbed 65% of the job losses. Um, we also know that as a virus, COVID is, is disproportionately impacting, for example, racialized essential workers, 42% of personal support workers are racialized and or newcomer women. We also saw, for example, hate crimes increase uh, towards Black, Asian, and Indigenous community members by 700%. So as I very quickly take you through our high level budget analysis, um, we kept that social context and, and economic context very much in mind in terms of what we were looking for from uh, the budget. Uh, to echo Ms. Greening's comments, um, and thank you so much, Ms. Greening, for mentioning childcare. Um, we also at y YWCA, we were very happy to see the emphasis on childcare, not just in terms of child development, but also as a return to work strategy um, as we start to look at COVID recovery. So the $30 billion over five years, um, with the goal of, of $10 a day childcare by 2026. That's, uh, that's a very high metric with respects to a key performance indicator. Um, but some of the stats that have come out around how childcare can support economic growth, uh, for example, the UK budget group, um, did some really interesting forecasting late last year. And they estimated that, for example, if the UK invested 1% of their GDP that would actually create 2 million care, care work jobs. So we are very much uh, with interest going to be looking at how childcare will be rolled out, um, but also rolling up our sleeves as a service provider to see what we can do to help. Um, some other points of interest, uh, again, the overall budget, um, I'll let you uh, review it. It's, it's a 724 page tome and, and uh, over, over 800 pages in French. Um, but it mentions the word women 669 times. So that gives you a sense of just how much focus of applying a gender-based analysis lens was applied to the budget. So for example, $2.2 billion over five years for a national action plan um, to coordinate uh, gender-based violence prevention. Um, also an additional 600 million to uh, look at raising awareness um, and education and around ending 
uh, violence. We saw, for example, with COVID that the pandemic resulted in a 20 to 30% increase in demand for services at domestic violence shelters. So we'll be watching uh, those rollouts very carefully. And in terms of the labor market access piece, um, they did uh, announce uh, 146.9 million over four years to enhance the resiliency around the women's entrepreneurship strategy. And that's going to be really important, especially as we look at procurement strategies and getting Canadians back to work as we recover. With respects to hate crimes and this global reckoning that we're seeing around anti-racism, um, as I mentioned earlier, hate crimes have increased 700% uh, since COVID started. So the $15 million over two years um, to support racialized newcomer women, um, will be following very closely. So with respects to YWCA, um, we were very interested to see the announcements. We were very pleased, uh, uh, in, just like Ms. Greening, very pleased in, in the substantial investments in childcare um, and very much looking forward to hearing from stakeholders on, on this panel around what other things that you felt were either missing in the budget or things that you feel are, are good evidence-based practice for, for policymakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. And now uh, going to hand over uh, the parole to Ms. Arladak. Thank you for joining us. And I think you have a slide to share with us as well. Thank you, indeed. I think Wendy's gonna share the slide, but uh, uh, like my esteemed colleagues, I, I simply wanted to share that um, it is a sincere pleasure to have been invited to this, uh, particularly to, to sit alongside uh, the colleagues that we have on this panel. I, I'm a, a big fan of many and, and admirer of, of, uh, of their work. Um, I, I wanted to begin by stating that while we're, my, our offices are, are based in Ottawa, I myself am currently based in Toronto and acknowledge that I'm on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, the Anishabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Uh, and sticking in terms of my lane, that uh, in terms of my contributions to today's conversation, a, a little bit about uh, the new digital research infrastructure organization. Um, in 2019, Innovation Science Economic Development, I said, as we often refer to them, announced a national DRI strategy, DRI standing for Digital Research Infrastructure. And the goal of the strategy was to provide all Canadians and scientists and scholars with the digital tools they needed to conduct world leading research. Um, and to support innovation in Canada. And so in support of this gold, I said set aside $375 million to establish a new national not-for-profit organization that uh, we're tentatively referring to ourselves as the new DRI organization. Um, and our job is to coordinate and fund activities in advanced research computing, uh, research data management and research software. And so in that context, uh, my comments as it relates to this year's federal budget relate to the contributions that were made to research and innovation and specifically uh, sort of grounding in the area of digital research infrastructure. And so the slide that you have uh, in front of you, uh, I did, uh, you know, within the context of what I could say within a few minutes, uh, basically a very high level SWOT analysis. And so uh, clearly in the area of strengths that I'd like to comment on is understanding the context in which this particular budget was delivered. Um, the last largest global pandemic influenza flu was in 1918 around World War I. And this budget has been touted um, as a $101 billion budget, which has been the largest spending budget since uh, World War II. And so the context is very similar to, to many of our uh, um, you know, fellow citizens back in the early uh, World War days. And so when many of us were anticipating what would come through this budget, we all uniformly expected a large COVID focus. And so I was particularly enamored and particularly pleased to still see uh, what I would consider to be significant commitment to innovation um, on this slide. And, and this slide is available. Uh, you're welcome to obtain it from our colleagues at CSPC. Um, uh, billions of dollars and hundreds of millions of dollars to a variety of uh, innovation-based initiatives uh, that are articulated on this slide. Uh, in terms of some of the weaknesses, uh, th these are ones that I pulled from Dave Waters' presentation that, that we all had the opportunity to, to hear, where despite these massive investments that we've made as a country and as provinces and territories, 
we, we continue to fall far short of our comparator nations, whether the G20 or the OECD, in terms of the level of contribution we're making to innovation spaces. And so my, my colleague uh, who spoke earlier, I think summarized it best that, you know, it, it's, it's virtually impossible to have a budget that everyone would be uniformly pleased with. Uh, and there continues to be massive demands. And so while, while we've made progress, I, I per personally was quite uh, pleased with the, um, the level of commitment that was made despite the context and environment, the COVID environment that we're all working with. Um, uh, as opportunities, um, many of my colleagues on this panel have spoken to uh, some of the um, pleasing elements of this budget as it corresponds to EDI and other aspects. Um, I was also quite happy to see some of that, uh, some of the emphasis that was made in this federal budget. One of the stories I would share as I sort of think about concluding my remarks is that one of the greatest opportunities in digital research really speaks to what I believe is Canada's pluralistic nature. And so one of the little experiments you can do, um, and it's obviously not a hardcore data analytic experiment, but tonight after, after uh, the symposium's over, talk to some friends or talk to a family member and pull out your cell phone, if, if you have a cell phone and say, you know, how do you do X, Y, Z on your cell phone? And uh, the likelihood that you will do it differently based on the person's age, gender, or ethnicity is actually quite high. And it's understandable because our lived experiences often formulate the ways in which our minds tend to formulate uh, how we think about doing certain tasks. And so I share that with you because um, Canada is largely comprised of a, of a sort of pluralistic uh, group of individuals and our digital software, digital uh, products are no exception. And so when we export our uh, research enabled software or our programming languages to European nations and other countries, those that I visited will often say that Canada's products are uh, quite suited because the likelihood that one of those have been created by an individual from France or Colombia or a Spaniard or, or an Italian, um, is, is quite high and that therefore the use, the intuitive use of that software or its uh, formulation is uh, influenced by their lived experiences. And so adoption rates are tremendously higher. And so as we think about, you know, Dave Waters comments or others that have, have commented about our competitive advantage, I think there's a real opportunity for Canada to truly exploit its competitive advantage in that speaks to the very fabric of who we are as Canadians, this multilingual pluralistic society. And so um, I should have thought about this in advance. I'm ending on a bit of a, on a, a negative note, but the threats that we also see um, is the increasing amounts of uh, cybersecurity uh, and breaches that are continuing to occur and have proliferated um, uh, since COVID. Uh, Maya talked about the, uh, in the earlier remarks just now, about the level of hate crimes that have increased since COVID. The other aspect that's increased in COVID is the level of state-sponsored cybersecurity hacks, uh, where uh, different countries are trying to access um, uh, intellectual property from, from neighboring nations or other nations, as well as uh, access COVID stores in anticipation of being able to COVID data stores in order to ant uh, anticipate uh, potential genetic information of, uh, of countries. And so this is well known and documented. And, and, and if you're in a university or, or post-secondary institution or research institution, the reason many of your IT colleagues are saying we need to really emphasize uh, cybersecurity is because uh, the threats and the number of hacks that have uh, proliferated since the beginning of COVID has actually um, yeah, magnified a uh, hundredfold. Um, so with that, I, I thought I would just give you that all overall uh, SWOT analysis on, on uh, uh, what I see is uh, uh, some strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats in the, in the federal budget, and happy to answer any questions that folks would have, and I'll turn it back to Andre. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Nazar. That was excellent. Um, and uh, having a, a trade background myself um, and looking at, at sort of Canadian experience and uh, diversity in our pluralistic nature and how we're now integrating that Indigenous voice in increasing ways, 
um, I think we're that that does set us up for that kind of larger uh, uh, both economic and social opportunities um, that uh, that can come about. So certainly, I think uh, uh, we've seen some of that in this federal budget. So thank you, each of you, for bringing some of that to the forefront. Um, I'm going to start us off with a with a, a question or two that I'll provide for each of you to that you can dive in and mix it up for a bit. Um, and uh, and then I believe that. Uh, the Q&A function will be um, open, um, so we'll start to collect those and please prioritize uh, for those of you listening in and uh, watching us uh, to add some questions, prioritize them, let us know your favorites, and I'll dig into those and start to ask those next. Um, I uh, So I, I guess I wanted to start... Um, this was the first budget in Canadian history to be delivered by a woman finance minister. So. Um, you know, a number of you raised uh, the, the, you know, a feminist response. Um, you're looking at how policy uh, within COVID has uh, um, needed to respond to uh, the specifically targeted impacted populations. Um, so women, uh, populations of color, um, uh, individuals who are uh, within the, you know, sort of uh, the, the hospitality sectors, and a large part of those are women, and so forth, right? So, uh, and 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 then the knock-on effects of that in terms of uh, housing security, food security, um, access to digital, uh, you know, uh, resources as well, um, which is an increasing sort of necessary human right, uh, which is also what we're seeing in these discussions. Um, so, uh, and and there was a conversation around this being a, a she session. Um, caused by this COVID pandemic. So, um, so a number of measures have been cited uh, and were identified within the social and economic vein um, from a number of your organization's perspectives. But uh, what do you think are the measures that need to now be taken to make these feminist measures lasting and meaningful? Um, and do you think this was enough to describe this as a, as a feminist budget? Um, I'm curious. So if we could maybe start there, I, you don't need to boil the ocean, certainly, but I, but let's let's start on that note. I think it's quite important uh, for our listeners. <laughs> Got a message right, jumping in. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm actually super curious to hear what um, Maya has to say um, in, in regards to this. And, and I know Giselle, you've, you've you've definitely alluded to some of this. And, and you know, speaking to the SDGs, right? There's very clearly a gender equity SDG as well. And and so we have COVID or not, we have a responsibility to to really be addressing the inequities that are experienced across the you know the the gender um, spectrum and and you know I think I've been encouraged by what's in the budget I think there's a lot of pieces we've touched on here that we've not seen articulated in previous budgets and you know it's definitely a step in the right direction but I think and again would love to hear what other folks are saying but you know the when the rubber hits the road so to speak I'm more equally kind of uh, interested in seeing what happens in who's actually monitoring the spending and the outcomes and ensuring that that is actually rooted in the voices um, and the lived experiences of the folks who are actually going to benefit from what's in this budget. Um, we often see kind of that that representation around some of these you know, consultation tables, but we don't necessarily see it in policy um, application. And that's the piece that I'm probably even more um, you know, intrigued by and interested in seeing what actually takes place. And, and there's a lot of spending that is happening in this budget that you could put under the feminist lens. Um, I'm interested in whether or not the feminist lens is applied to, to the, you know, the spending, the application and the measurement of it um, as we move forward in the coming weeks and months and years. Yes, I, I, I would agree. And sorry, that was just the most Canadian thing ever. <laughs> I just, I, I, I feel compelled to, to comment on that. Um, but yes, thank you. I, I would agree. What, what gets measured gets done. Um, and that's fundamentally what we're going to be looking at. Uh, so thank you, for example, for pointing out the importance of 
of you know spending and centering indigenous voices. We know um, young uh, indigenous youth and uh, newcomers and specifically newcomer women and youth are two of the fastest growing demographics in, in Canada. Um, and I think following, essentially following the money and following the disaggregated data is going to be very, very important. So I know, um, and, and I can't speak on, on behalf of um, Indigenous colleagues, but, you know, very important to um, also take a look at, for example, uh, the $2 billion that was allocated towards Head Start. Um, so that's going to be really important because that's a really clear um, federal program with really solid evidence behind it in terms of how it positively impacts um, child development. But then you have other internal government mechanisms where if most of the money is flowing to distinctions-based communities, uh, urban, urban Indigenous community members often, often get fall through the cracks um, with respect to services. So I think how that money is going to be spent, having really clear key performance indicators with respects to economic impact, social impact, determinants of health. Um, and unfortunately, you know, right now with COVID and, and vaccination, um, it's providing um, a bit of an absurd uh, case study uh, you know, being able to look at the disaggregated data by community, but then across provinces and territories, because you essentially have um, this, you know, linear, linear vaccination rollout, um, but you have exponential growth. Um, and the math, the math and the policy and then the opera operations simply don't line up. Um, so I think we're, we're learning uh, through COVID and I'm looking forward to seeing some of the mathematical modeling that'll be coming out, uh, especially as the budget gets sent, uh, spent. I would just uh, maybe add three short points uh, to, to what my colleagues have said. Uh, first that I think we need to see this as the result of not just 40 years of struggle. I would go back to the 19th century, uh, late 19th century in particular all over the world where, where women's movements were really bubbling up. Uh, and so, you know, we have to see this as, and not an easy struggle, which brings me to the second point of the, the intersectional challenge, which I think uh, both Maya and Janessa have raised that unfortunately, like a lot of social movements, um, there, there, that hasn't been acknowledged enough. And so in the both the conceptualization and design and delivery of all of the programming around this, that the importance of that intersectional lens to uh, ensure that uh, Black, Indigenous, women of color, et cetera, uh, Francophone, you know, uh, sexual orientation, all of those questions, gender identity, that it be taken into account um, and, and nuanced. And I think this is, you know, the third is the assumptions. You know, I think we, if we're going to talk about, I think very highly of Dave Waters, I've been to his house, I've been to his, you know, to his office many times, but I think there are assumptions, universalistic assumptions that are made that are actually not universal. And when you start to have that lens of gender, race, class, uh, whatever it is, you start to discover, oh, um, well, maybe it doesn't quite work that way. Or maybe there are other ways of seeing the economy, you know, ecological economics, feminist economics. Now we're talking about donut economics. And, you know, the Council of Canadian Academies has a study right, right now on the circular economy being led by a brilliant woman of color, Tima Bansal from Ivy Business School uh, at Western. So, you know, this isn't a sort of something from the 60s anymore. I mean, it's it's mainstreaming and we need to we need to embrace that challenge. Yeah, the, what, what I would add, Andre, just to round out what what my colleagues have, have said more articulately is what I was encouraged um, is the fact that there was uh, at least an attempt made to take an intersectional lens to this budget. Um, and, and so for, for those of us who were recipients of some of the, the, the large spending, it's forced a change in the dialogue and it's forced a change in the conversation. So even in an area where I think, you know, people would say, oh, okay, Nizar, you're responsible for digital infrastructure and, and automation. The conversation that I'm now having with my board and funding recipients that we're using is asking them, in light of what has been signaled as priorities for this federal government, how are you going to help contribute to that? So we're asking questions around, we've been talking for long enough about better representation of women in STEM professions. 
how are you going to help move that as recipients of this funding, as condition of this funding? I'm having conversations with individuals about as we dole out new um, automation and digital dollars, how are we taking advantage or, or pro, uh, propelling Indigenous researchers to make their, their case and, and to look at things like data sovereignty and respecting their data management frameworks and data sovereignty issues that we you know have long gone ignored. Um, and so I think that even just the nature of the conversation has changed in very positive ways by virtue of what the federal government is, are signaling as this is where we'd like the, the community to move toward. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, so it's interesting because, um, <clears throat> so I'm uh, in a small business actually, uh, uh, you know, owner occupied, that sort of thing. And um, one of the things we see with our clients is that uh, there is a significant, both in the private and public sectors, um, uh, that there's a significant increase in interest in this area, right? Like, so um, uh, equity, um, how they approach uh, their business models, what that means for them, both in terms of hiring practice, uh, but also as it relates to the actual um, meaningful employment of, of individuals, uh, uh, you know, into the longer term, and so the policies that go along to that. So we've seen child care programs, um, you know, being discussed and so forth. Um, but uh, you know, how challenging themselves in terms of, of of what that means. We're doing it as a company, but our clients are as well. And so those new new sort of challenges. Um, I, I do want to pick up on on something that I, I heard sort of through their uh, through your conversation so far, and. Um, uh, and, and in the presentation that Dave Waters uh, made, and, I, made, and I, I do have a lot of respect for him as well. And um, the R&D conversation is something that uh, I think I've lost most of my hair because of that, um, uh, you know, Canada's declining R&D rate. And so we're all looking at, and especially private sector R&D and how, we, how do we stimulate that and commercialization and where is that innovation and science piece that comes together in a way that actually, um, you know, deploys capital in a productive uh, labor-oriented uh, uh, manner uh, uh, for, for Canada. And um, so one of the things that he sort of identified um, is to uh, help accelerate Canadian R&D and innovation performance. The Canada should rebalance our game from defense to offense, which is great, um, and place less emphasis on social equity at the front end and more support uh, for economic growth um, uh, sort of at, at this point in time. So make the pie bigger first and then allocate pieces equitably. So um, is that, when, when I heard some, some conversation about sort of that, uh, uh, the, you know, where, I guess, where, where does that come together, that social and economic piece, uh, particularly as we're, whether we're looking at a feminist budget or we're just looking at, at, at budget making overall at this moment in time? Yeah, um, that's a really interesting question. And, and um, what I would like to propose is that um, your equity goals and your economic goals are in fact hand in glove. Um, because when you don't have equity, um, quite, quite bluntly, capitalism can't function. You cannot pipeline talent. You cannot have supply chain. For example, if we have, if our biggest trading partner to the South, the US has regular bouts of domestic terrorism, um, such as we saw with, with the Capitol Hill riots on January 6th. Um, and, and fundamentally to your point, you know, we have, for example, Silicon Valley, um, where I think big tech actually now has to start to acknowledge just how imperative equity is. So for example, um, when I talked earlier about hate speech, um, a lot of that hate speech that we're seeing that's happening online, um, that was very much the foundation of, of what happened in the US and what also disrupted their economy and, and potentially could also impact markets. Um, that was actually driven by social media. Um, and tech companies have acknowledged, for example, by not having diverse hiring, um, when you have white human reviewers who, who are, you know, may not recognize what hate speech towards Indigenous people um, in Manitoba are experiencing. And certainly what we saw with Myanmar and Facebook, um, when you don't understand that you're seeing cultural genocide on your platform, how do you respond? But then also the impact, not just in terms of human rights abuses and actual genocide, but the impact on the global economy. So I would argue um, that the rationale for, for equity also includes prosperity. 
Yeah, if if I could jump in and just compliment what Maya has been saying is, um, I don't see them as mutually exclusive. In fact, I think they're mutually reinforcing. Uh, if you take even simple examples uh, that you know Maya Maya commented on, um, if we continue to have a, a gender imbalance in STEM professions, then the way to use a sports analogy, we're only paying the fifty percent of our team. And so if you want to think about equity and uh, economic growth, why are you only playing with half your team? If we're not giving the opportunities to new Canadians who, who come extraordinarily uh, skilled and, and ready for these kinds of professions, we're disadvantaging ourselves. And, and based on my earlier remarks, it's actually those varying lived experiences that we want to take advantage of in building our products and digital services. Canada is actually ranked 11th on the planet in terms of uh, digital uh, skills and competencies. Uh, and so we're punching way above our weight. And I think we, we have a real opportunity to take advantage of uh, in engaging them in, in, in our, our citizens in innovation and, and, uh, and, and to, to be able to really propel uh, good paying, great jobs with the future. Can I jump in quickly, Andre? Um, I, you know, trickle down economics has never worked. And I thought COVID-19 did, did in that thinking, but, um, you know, the redistribution of wealth has always been the sort of trickiest and most contentious public policy issue since time immemorial, actually, um, <laughs> since the dawn of civilization. Um, and so, you know, you either, you either accept that distribution of wealth and redistribution of wealth, whether it's income or whether it's land or whether it's other resources is critical. We have enough on this planet for everybody. I mean, we're, we're trashing the planet and that needs to stop. But, um, you know, it goes back to my previous uh, point about where does our wealth really come from in the end? And, you know, what is the current distribution of wealth on this planet, in this country, et cetera? And it is the minority that are controlling the majority of land and income, et cetera. And, and that's, you know, that's a point. It may be, we may have to agree to disagree, but in terms of social policy, public policy, economic policy, that's a, just a fundamental issue that needs to be tackled. And, you know, I'll just um, pipe in a little bit too. And again, the, the Reagan economics um, haven't proven out uh, and uh, nor is this a pie. I, I find that analogy really uh, frustrating. The reality is that the pie gets bigger, only certain pieces tend to also get larger. And so, you know, we have, as Gisela said, more than enough to go around. And the the analogy I think that is more applicable is a rising tide raises all boats. We actually benefit as individuals from a societal approach to the whether it's, you frame it as redistribution or you frame it as everyone deserves an equal opportunity to live a full life and, and they get you know to improve their health outcomes to have access to education to be able to make a life for themselves that only actually increases tax base increases gdp increases all of the measures what does not do that is increasing the size of the pie um it just it doesn't work in the reverse and so you know this budget i'm encouraged because i do believe it has taken into consideration that this pandemic has only unveiled greater disparities um in our society it has compounded and acutely impacted particular communities that deserve to have the access to our greater societal benefits that we all do on this call. And I, I think that, um, you know, I, I appreciate what David said. I, I desperately disagree <laughs> with the perspective and um, it doesn't it doesn't play out. It, it just and we've never seen that be a successful approach, just like not taxing corporations is also not a successful approach. Right. We, we, we recognize that uh, we have to do our due diligence to hold up and it's you know, you talked, Nazar, about how we are a society of pluralism and, and we appreciate all those pieces. We have to appreciate those, you know, holistically, not just a token as a token to, to represent um, ourselves as, as an accepting society. Thank you. I, um, so uh, one of the other things, uh, and Janessa, I'd just start with you uh, as a warning. Um, that I want to flag uh, is a question because I, I do work with a number of uh, health and life sciences organizations and um, and a number of them in the health charitable sector and the charitable sector generally. And um, so uh, 
Um, just wondering from a budgetary perspective from this budget, um, I think that Imagine Canada uh, was concerned about um, some of the aspects that did not um, sort of uh, were not deployed in this budget. And um, in, in that respect, and I'm just wondering if you could comment either in terms of what was deployed or wasn't deployed um, around the charitable sector, if there are things that you're looking at there and how that overlays into the, you know, into this conversation about equity and, and, and mm -hmm. I, I think they are implicitly tied to each other. And so, you know, the we often miss under, uh, or underestimate the impact of the nonprofit sector on our economy. And so in Canada, it makes up, I'm gonna, I, I wrote down the stats because I, I really wanted to make sure I got these right, but, you know, $169 billion of our GDP in 2017 was attributable to the nonprofit sector. It makes up 2.4 million jobs. There's only 15 million employed Canadians. So you start, it's 15% of this, you know, of employed Canadians work in the sector. We're at risk of a 30% contraction to the nonprofit sector as a result of the impact of this pandemic. So how do, why does that matter outside of obvious GDP impacts and obvious employment impacts is the nonprofit sector is the safety net for our safety net. It is the most inexpensive way to be able to ensure we actually achieve equity in this country. And so, you know, if we don't take care of this sector, we will find a far more expensive budget coming down the line in being able to actually provide government funded housing, government funding, you know, related to whether it's prisons or foster care, all these other pieces that end up having to pick it up and it, that's not the way we want our communities to be supported and if you look at the airport you know or the airline industry which you know i recognize is in a very important industry but they only make three point they only make up 3.2 percent of the gdp or 633,000 jobs and i want you to think about how much the airline industry has been supported in these last few months and what we've actually seen directly articulated for the nonprofit sector in this budget which is really pretty minuscule at the end of the day um you know sues and rental subsidies and some of those smaller granting programs yes they were helpful it's not going to get us through to the other side and without the non i mean the nonprofit sector from a gender equity perspective employs more women than men and there are more female beneficiaries to the nonprofit sector than there are men and so if we want a feminist recovery we have got to figure out what to do about the nonprofit sector and it was desperately missing in this um, in this budget are there others that would like to comment on that at all right yeah, yeah I, I I would agree again um, there is a 400 million dollar uh, recovery fund essentially for nonprofits that was built into the budget um, to start to think about um, what Ms. Ms. Greening talked about. Um, again, I think like with all budget line items, the devil is in the details. Um, I, I think uh, for the charitable sector, certainly at the YWCA, we've seen demand for our services increase, but um, many, um, many of our fundraisers, for example, were canceled. Um, due, due to COVID. So I think the more um, we can start talking about core funding, um, especially considering um, the economic recovery impacts, but fundamentally from a policymaker point of view, you can either pay now or pay later. Um, so what we've really been pushing at, at the Y is investing in labor market access, upskilling and reskilling now um, to avoid uh, the hairy, you know, issues with social assistance costs later, and fundamentally, but part of the problem there are there are billions of dollars flowed through from the feds to the provinces each year around labor market access, but many of those programs and reskilling programs are actually structured on a model of, of when we still had manufacturing jobs and manufacturing jobs were leaving for the global south. Well, those jobs are gone, and. Um, you know, we know 33% of the jobs that we lost due to automation because of COVID are not coming back. Um, and so fundamentally, it's about looking, how do we connect um, women, vulnerable women, gender diverse youth to knowledge economy jobs? Um, what does it mean to train them up for cybersecurity or data analytics positions in a micro scaling way? Because um, especially with COVID and work from home, nobody has 
you know, the time to go and do a two year degree. So these are some of the kinds of conversations we're having with funders and policymakers. And we're doing some research internally at the Y through our Born to be Bold program to actually measure also to what are what are some of these potential key performance indicators and where um, as, as policymakers and as service providers, um, can we get the biggest impact that, that women need? Uh, so my colleagues in Hamilton, for example, are actually scaling up a women and innovation uh, program in, in five sites across Ontario. Um, but absolutely, I think that's going to be a key discussion that the private sector, nonprofits, and policymakers need to have is, is around women's labor market access. And, and really love your, your metaphor, Nazar, around you know, not playing with 50% of your team. Uh, I'm going to quote you, uh, but that is the only sports analogy I could ever, ever possibly use. So thank you. I, I will be quoting you on that. I'm just wondering quickly, though, if we can collaborate better in the not-for-profit sector and work across institutions, movements, and, and kind of form a little bit of a, I don't mean to say a cartel, but, you know, we're often competing against each other. And, I, and I'm really wondering if we can use this budget as an opportunity to come together. There's, you know, social innovation, social economy, social finance money. There's the, the you know, environment and climate change. So can we do that instead of, you know, going at it in our little corners? I would I, I could not be more pleased to hear you say that Giselle because um, I think that's that's been a mantra that we've been using as a new organization is it's more about collaboration than competition and and this is a perfect example where um, as we look to uh, maximizing or, or you know them optimizing the budget dollars um, there are people that even just in, in, the, in the illustration of this panel, who know more about certain areas. And so why would I try to reinvent the wheel? So you can bet right after this call, I'm gonna reach out to Maya and say, as you're thinking about micro skilling, I've got a huge appetite to take all of those individuals and pay them good wages. Um, because quite frankly, I'm getting calls from the bohemets, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, who are saying, can we, we want to set up head offices because Canada's already proven they have the type of skills and the talent uh, in a socialized um, sort of environment that gives good paying jobs and all that. And so we want to come there, but can you, can you open the doors for us and can you ensure that we'll have a steady stream of people to hire? And so why wouldn't I work with the YWA, WCA or, or even in, um, as Giselle has talked about, you know, there are certain things that we that we want to be able to do in our in our uh, environment when uh, sorry, in our economy, like we talk about green data centers, we talk about uh, saving the planet in terms of uh, the polluters and other things of that nature. And unfortunately, like I'm ashamed to say that um, uh, the data centers now have outpaced nuclear energy and the aviation industry as carbon emitters. And so while I'm promoting digitization, I'm also looking, oh my God, we're, we're destroying the planet by virtue of what we're doing. So, you know, are there, are there uh, initiatives that we can embark on together to create more green data centers and reuse these things? So I, I love the idea of saying, this is not an area of expertise that I have, but it's a problem I have and, it's a, and, and, and you have the expertise to help us solve it. So can we work together to help do that? Um, well, that's exciting. I, uh, so one of the things that I guess I would observe, and I think we're almost at time here, um, and then I think Mirdad is, uh, uh, Hilary is going to come and uh, uh, make some closing remarks, but um, one of the things I, I would observe that's really, what a wonderful way to, to close off a session like this, because um, it shouldn't be a zero-sum game. It's, it shouldn't be competitive, in fact, and I think for um, uh, populations and for politicians involved in this sort of stuff that in fact, um, you know, uh, organizations coming together and providing common solutions that actually do the, do the heavy lifting and, and cut across departmental and jurisdictional sort of, uh, you know, issues. I think one of the things that COVID is um, kind of is, is bringing to the forefront for policymakers is, the, is that uh, Canadians are fed up with that, that they actually want uh, solutions that cut across jurisdictions. They get that there's a constitution and all that sort of stuff, but um, how do we achieve those objectives to actually achieve outcomes for Canadians and for others outside of our borders that impact us as well? So um, so I think that's a fabulous way to, to close off this discussion because I think that's a productive uh, uh, way to, to stimulate our thinking and to those of 
of, of our audience who have been listening. I, um, I think each of, each of you would probably challenge them to think about how they could participate in that kind of collaborative uh, uh, and environment, looking at what they're involved in and how they can uh, provide that within their own communities, uh, both in their volunteer work and uh, uh, within their own uh, employment and academic uh, uh, work that they're doing. So with that, I would like to thank uh, Nazar, Maya, Giselle, and Janessa for joining us on this panel today. I know, I, like, listen, I, I love this stuff and I really enjoyed our conversation. And uh, thank you for taking the time to do this because it's, uh, it's important for Canadian public policy. A budget document is a, should not be a moment in time. It's something that will, will be as meaningful as each of you make it. So, uh, so thank you for spending the time today to start to, to, to talk about those ideas. And now I think we're sending, we're, it's over to Mirdad. Yes, uh, Andre, thank you, the panel. Merci énormément. Andre for excellent moderation and uh, Giselle, Maya, Janessa, Nizor for remarkable insights and discussions. And it was fascinating for me as someone from nonprofit sector, by the way, to hear your viewpoints. It was fascinating, especially the last point. And you bet I come back to you uh, with some ideas and I'm sure our, the attendees enjoyed the discussion very much. Uh, this was the sixth and the final panel of the CSPC Budget Symposium. There you go, there is a poll and please take the time to answer this one question and provide us with your feedback. It's always helpful to hear what you think and to see what you think uh, about the symposium, about this particular panel, of course. And uh, I wanna thank all the panelists uh, of the symposium to Dave Waters and uh, Omar Kaya and uh, all the panelists of superclusters, critical analysis and business and also university panel earlier today. Uh, to my knowledge, perhaps this was the most extensive conference style and in multi-sectoral nature uh, about the federal budget in Canada. And the good news is that we hope to continue this work and to, uh, to uh, have future conversations in a more perhaps systematic way on a comprehensive analysis of R&D investment uh, and uh, in general. Uh, for that, we need your help, your ideas, your engagement and your support. Uh, please send us your ideas and opinions to info@sciencepolicy.ca. And I also wanna remind everyone that the deadline for panel submissions, panel proposals for the uh, 13 Canadian Science Policy Conference is coming up soon, it's May 21st. And please consider submitting your proposals around all the discussions that you have heard. These are all part of the topics of the, this year's conference. And uh, I think um, putting together a symposium of this scale, as you may know, takes a lot of people and energy involved in this. And I wanna thank on your behalf uh, for, to, to those people who have uh, worked really hard for about two months to put this symposium together from our volunteer team, Aya Abdel Ayam. Kaila Scott, Victor Lotoki, Sofia Pineda, and from CSPC office, Wendy Zhu, Soha Sani, and Alessandra Zimmerman. And finally, last but certainly not the least, all of you who uh, took time out of your very busy schedule and participated at this symposium. Over, overall, uh, I received the data over the course of two days, more than 350 participants attended this symposium. I want to thank you sincerely and ask you please to stay in touch with us and send us your feedback. Merci et au revoir, à la prochaine.